So um, in the fall of 2007 was the first time that I met Leticia. And she became a very important person in my life, and I think I in hers. Um, she came into the clinic where I was teaching. I was teaching in a law school clinic for, we did workers' rights cases. And Leticia had been told that she better needs to talk to a lawyer and had been sent to me. And she came into my office, she came over to the clinic and with her husband Abraham, who also became important to me and is important in this story. Uh, and we went into a conference room and she started to tell me her story. And as she told it, she just sobbed. She just cried quietly. She couldn't stop. The tears just came down her face as she talked the entire time. And she, her hands kind of shook. And, and she, I was often looking down at her hands and sort of crumpled in on herself. And when she told me her story, I, I understood why she felt that way. Um, she as a, uh, was a 30-some-year-old woman who was from Mexico and had come here to the United States where she met her husband who was from Guatemala. Um, and they both worked, had two lovely children. Uh, they were eight and ten at the time and they both worked multiple jobs supporting their family, second shift, third shift, picking up an extra shift if the son needed to go to their trip, the school trip to Washington DC to see our government, you know, they did that. Um, and she had been working, both of them worked in the commercial cleaning industry um, and were, uh, she was a cleaner at the Ridgedale Mall, which for anyone who isn't from here is a kind of a f Shishi Mall in a suburb of Minneapolis. Um, she worked on the second shift, so that's like afternoon until 11 o'clock at night. Um, and a number, most of the people who worked there were um, immigrants. Most of them spoke only or mostly Spanish. And there was just one boss there, this guy named Marco. And for all they knew, and some of them I learned later, did think he was the company, he was it. He was the only person. He was the one who could communicate with the company if there was one other than he. And he hired them, he took in their paperwork when they were hired. Many of them gave paperwork they knew was not valid and he knew it too and it just wasn't discussed but it was accepted and filed with. And on they went, he supervised them and he had the ability to hire and fire. Um, and uh, at first he was really nice to her and um, so she felt kind of kind of okay, she felt good. And he, um, but then he started making her feel a little uncomfortable. He was kind of, he'd compliment her a little bit too much and talk about how he liked her clothes and he wished she wore tighter pants and things like that. And she started to get uncomfortable and nervous. And within um, a couple of months after her second, she, she, he fired her at one point and, and later I thought, was that just to make the point to her that he could do that? Um, because he did at one point fire her and then ran and recruited her to come back, um, needing her that day, please come, and, and she did. She never had understood why he fired her in the first place. So she started back again and within a couple of months, um, he, became, started behaving in this way that made her uncomfortable and um, within not much longer he had, he had this basement office in the Ridgedale Mall where the cleaning company had some space. And it was windowless and it had a lock and he, she would come into the office beginning and end of her shifts to report in and one of these times he locked the door and he raped her. And she was of course, shocked, horrified, embarrassed, um, and didn't know what to do. Um, and she knew though, the one thing that he said was, if you tell anyone, I will report you to immigration. And she knew exactly what that threat would mean for her. She would be deported to Mexico immediately and her two sons who were born in this country, these eight and 10 year old boys, would lose her. So she didn't. And he took full advantage of that 
now that his threats worked, and he did it again and again. And finally, after about four times over a few months, her family noticed that something was very, very wrong with her. She was isolating herself. She wasn't talking. Sometimes she would talk to herself. She, uh, her husband knew something was very wrong, and he finally said, Leticia, tell me what is wrong. Don't look at me as your husband. Look at me as your friend, and just tell me what is wrong. So she finally told him, and he said, you're not going back there again. Um, he restrained himself from going, and he did go and confront the, this man, but he didn't, he restrained his temper and desire um, because he knew that he would be arrested and deported if anything happened, if he did anything. And so, um, so they went to start looking for help. They went to nonprofit organizations they, that, where they spoke Spanish, and folks eventually steered them to me. And I was working in this little clinic in the law school. We ha had about 10 to 12 students, and they were there for a full year. Um, so they got to do some, could do some more in-depth work on cases. And um, they were pretty excited about this case. Some of them spoke Spanish, and we dove right in. So Leticia reported her. She had not previously reported to the police, but we encouraged her and said, you can do this, and you can do this safely, because we're going to refer you to some immigration attorneys who are going to help you get a special visa that is for victims of crimes to make it safe for you to report. So we did those things, and she went to the police, and she told her story. Um, and they took it seriously enough that they went out, they executed a search warrant, um, took samples of the carpet in this office and um, other things. But it turned out later, we found out Marco had already changed the carpet and painted the walls and changed the furniture when after Abraham confronted him. So there was nothing left for the police to find um, in terms of actual physical evidence. So we told Leticia, we will help you. We will try to, we, we want justice for you. We'll help you. And we brought a charge with the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Um, and so I thought, you know, the company's going to know now what happened. This is, they're going to, they're going to be worried. They're going to be so concerned. They're going to send somebody down here to Minneapolis. They're going to figure out what's going on. They're going to, typically in a case like that, a company wants that to go away quickly and quietly. But that was not the approach of this company. Um, it, it, the employees there thought Marco might just be the company. He might be it. But it turned out, of course, they had some paperwork. And it had the name of a company on it, but no address, no idea. I, I, you know, I read it all, and no idea where this company is. Um, it just had the name, this service management system. Who are they? Where are they? Well, of course, if you have access to the internet and you speak English fluently and you can read it and write it, it doesn't take long to figure out, well, they're a Nashville company. They own, you know, they have five different, it's a holding company and five different companies and they do the cleaning at many of the places that we go to, our malls and our airports across the country. So they have thousands of employees like Leticia. And they, uh, their way of dealing with this, their response was, well, let, let's just have Marco. Let's have the guy that she's accusing. Let's have him go investigate. So he's the only guy on site. He's the only guy that speaks Spanish and English. So he goes out and interviews a bunch of employees and finds out all kinds of just terrible things about Leticia which I'm not going to do him the favor of repeating, because they were just horrible. So from there on out, she, her entire experience of this case was, I have to disprove that I am this terrible person. I'm a cheat, and, and I'm a liar, and I, you know, all the men in the workplace have been with me, and just terrible things that were horribly embarrassing to her and well, completely untrue. Um, but she did, along the way, she found another woman who had, who had um, quit working there very quickly and didn't come back. And Abraham, her husband, ran into her one day and, and said, you know, something very bad has happened to Leticia. And she said, I know. Like, as soon as she heard that, she said, I know what's happened because it happened to me too. So we had a second person who had the same thing happen to her, terrible sexual assault in that locked basement office which made us feel like we could really help Leticia, because with a second person who's saying the same thing and who isn't trying to seek anything, um, that makes your case so much stronger. So this company then, though, did not see that as important at all. Um, they continued to have this man investigate. They continued. They actually lost the contract with this mall, 
So they had to clean up their stuff and get it out of this work site. So even though we had already filed a federal charge of discrimination and they were under an obligation to keep any documents and anything related, any evidence, they had Marco pack up the computer, ship it back to them in Nashville, and they deleted everything. They wiped it. So that was challenge one in this for us, where how we can't get this evidence, what do we do? Um, they completed this investigation where they found out every horrible thing they possibly could about Leticia, um, and they offered to rehire the man. They said, Marco, we just think you're really good at this, so if you, you know, I know that our contract here is ending, but we'll send you to X, Y, or Z city at a, you know, wonderful salary, we think you're great. So we upped the ante and we filed a federal lawsuit, we filed a civil lawsuit. <coughs> And at this time, I'm working at the clinic by then. Um, one of the smartest things I ever did in my life was to beg and plead with Jill Galding, who you heard from earlier, until she would come and join me. And um, she, we were co-teaching this clinic okay. and um, together. So um, then a couple of things happened that sort of knocked the wind out of us. This Carla, who was going to be our, our amazing second witness, we kept trying to find her. We kept trying to call her. We couldn't find her and she disappeared, she was gone. So I had students for well over a year looking for her, calling her. I had the Spanish speaking ones, one lived in LA, I sent her to an old address, sit outside her house, see if you can, anything. I had a student who was working for a private investigator. We did every search we knew how to do, could not find this woman. And I'm feeling like a terrible lawyer. Like if I had acted faster, if I had told those students, call her today, go out and get her statement, you know, everything would be different and I'm gonna, this mistake of mine is gonna lose this case. And that, and, and then the company hired three law firms. So we had three law firms working on the other side. One of them especially just for Marco. So his insur the insurance company paid for him to have his very own corporate defense lawyer. And then the company had two others. So Jill and I, ended up at that point, the clinic just sort of seemed to decide this is way too, way too complicated for us and way too much action and chaos and, you know, students running around and, and uh, we, this is not a correct pedagogical environment. So rather than dumb down my clinic, I decided Leticia's case is too important. Jill and I went, we took it, we started gender justice. Two more years went by. Leticia came to our office almost every day. I mean, I'm sorry, almost every week. She, her husband brought her every single time. And every single time they left, and we were discouraged, and we had to fight all these battles, his, her husband, Abraham, would say, La Justicia! <laughs> and we'd all laugh, and yes, we're gonna get it, La Justicia! Um, so, after those, as a result of those two years of Jill and me staying up all night, paying for the cost of this case out of our pockets, not making any money, no salary, um, we eventually, it finally paid off. For one thing, I found Carla, and I found Carla on Facebook. <laughs> it's one of my very favorite moments, sitting in my office, and all of a sudden this little email blip comes in. I had sent her an email, I had sent her a Facebook message saying, I'm this lawyer, I'm working on this case against this company, I know there was a Carla who worked there. Our, you know, please contact me. Days went by, I'm dejected, it didn't work, I thought I found her. All of a sudden, popped into my email box. I am that Carla, call me. And it had her phone number. And the first thing it said, she said when I called her, that man belongs in jail. I'll do anything, I'll go anywhere, I'll do anything and I'll testify whatever you need, I'll do it. And she did. So in the end, we found Carla. Carla came, she gave her testimony, she flew here from California. We got the courts to make that company give us records of every sexual harassment complaint brought internally, making it through the system that they didn't have for reporting them, and everything they did in response to them across the entire country. We spent $20,000 out of pocket um, to hire a computer expert to finally find what might be left on that computer that they wiped out. And what did we find? I mean, I doubted myself so many times. My God, you're spending your own family's money. What are you doing? This is never gonna turn into anything. It's all been wiped, there's nothing there. But we kept fighting and in the end, all that was left was an internet search history from this man from years before Leticia worked there. And where did he go for websites searching at work? Freeraperpics.com. 
was one of his favorite websites. He also went to websites about how to set up your own porn website um, and other violent porn websites. So that was really you know, the turning point. Um, we had an exceptionally favorable hearing before the judge. The case ended up resolving um, before trial. Part of me really, and I think Jill too, really wanted to see that case go to trial because what we were proving is that an undocumented worker in this country can get justice. And we did. Um, and she won an award from the National Employment Lawyers Association. I was so proud to sit next to her and watch her from that day that she sat in front of me sobbing. She sat next to me in front of hundreds and hundreds of lawyers in Denver receiving this national award that Lily Ledbetter received before her and telling, told her story with her husband sitting in the front row and her son. Um, and as she did that, and she was a better speaker than I, um, but she was being, there was an interpreter and so everything she said, then the interpreter said, and then the lawyers got to ask questions. And finally, toward the end, a, a lawyer stood up and said, well, what I'd like to know is, do you think that you got justice? And sitting next to her in front of everyone, I thought, God, I don't know what she's, I don't know what I would say in her situation. You know, she did 13 hours of deposition. She was treated so horribly and she did it all for so long. And there was a pause, a fairly long pause. And she said, see, sí. and no one needed an interpreter and the entire room stood up and applauded. 